Hello and welcome to the Doof Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Matt Freeman. I'm a 77-year-old soldier trapped in a jolly green giant. And my name is Scott Daly, and I'm three. Weird. <laughs> hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope you're having a wonderful Friday evening. Say hello in chat so we can greet you all. Uh, I'm sure we know a lot of you folks here, but if you are joining us for the very first time, Welcome to the book club. We are Doof Media and we make podcasts all about the stories we love. We also arrange and organize this here monthly book club. That's right. Uh, each month, Scott and I select five books from a pool submitted to us by our wonderful Doof community. We put up a poll for all the supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia, and we let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it. And then we meet here on the last Friday of the month, which is tonight, and spend a couple hours discussing the book. We pull slides of interesting moments, and uh, and we lead the discussion all about th this story. Matt, what book did our patrons select for us this month? This month, the patrons selected Old Man's War by John Scalzi. And the summary from Goodwe Goodreads is as follows. John Perry did two things on his 75th birthday. First, he visited his wife's grave. Then he joined the army. Well, this is a long summary. <laughs> the can, good news. You can uh, summarize the summary if you want. Or, uh, or just edit it down. Okay. The good news is that humanity finally made it into interstellar space. The bad news is that planets fit to live on are scarce, and alien races willing to fight us for them are common. So we fight to defend Earth and to take our own claim to planetary real estate. Far from Earth, the war has been going for decades. Brutal, bloody, unyielding. John Perry is taking the deal of oh, god this is so complicated <laughs> all right sorry. all right folks what happens is they offer you that they're gonna give you new life if you join the army when you get old and then john perry does that and then that's why it's called old man's war i see i get it i get it um all right we in the chat i see miss evil doom i see john i see david i see Kristen. i see chris hello everyone good to see you um john is saying that very nice things about your your cut hairs matt well, thank you. Good I had them cut. All of them? Uh, I think so. I didn't check. <laughs> All right. Um, this is the part of the show where we talk about our overall impressions of the book. And I'm only prefacing this because I want you folks to tell us what you thought of this book. When did you read it? Did you read it just for the book club or had you read it in the past? And what did you think of it? And as this message is going out to you there in the world of YouTube delays, Matt... What did you think of John Scalzi's Old Man's War? I enjoyed it. I think I enjoyed the first half of it quite a bit, and I enjoyed the second half uh, less, mainly due to a sense of not understanding what the thematic point of certain things was, which I think we're going to talk about. But yes. on the entertainment level, I thought the first part was very entertaining and interesting and had me really hooked and overall, I think it was a good book that I enjoyed reading. That is my 10,000-foot view. What did that, you think about it? I am, uh, I'm, I'm there with you. I enjoyed my time with this book. This was a very quick read. I think I read it in like three days. Um, you know, just kind of tore right through it. Um, enjoyed it. The more I think about the book, the more questions I have, the more confused I am as to what I think the book is trying to do. Um, and I think that's a lot of fun stuff that's going to be really, really fun a good time to dive into it. So um, I, there, there's so many little interesting bits. I'm just not sure if they coalesce together into something. And I think, you know, to, to be completely honest, I, I follow John Scalzi on Twitter. I know his politics. So as I started seeing what this book was, I kind of got in my head of what I thought the thematic message of this book was going to be. And it didn't go there. And maybe that's part of why I was so confused, but um I don't know. We'll, we'll get into it. For yeah. Sure. I mean, I didn't, I don't think I had a specific sense of where it was going. It was more that there kept being ideas introduced to the story. And I would think that's interesting. Where are we going with that? And then the answer seemed to be, we're not going anywhere with that. Yeah. You, if, if you're going to do anything with that, then you're going to have to figure it out on your own. Um, yeah. which, which might be fine. Uh, that, that, that's one thing where I'm like, um, I kind of enjoy I kind of enjoy thinking like well, what am I supposed to be getting out of this because sure. I don't think he just like messed up you know 
Um, and no, hopefully, I think that you know, I think that goes against our our whole our whole mission here, right? Is that exactly. to assume that it was not a mistake, but some intentional choice. And what what does that mean? I think as we get into it, we might figure some of these things out. So we have a lot of a lot of feedback in the chat so far. Uh, John agrees with me about being confused about the themes, mm -hmm. but uh, but enjoying it and finding it entertaining. Yeah, Miss Evil Doom says that they had read it a few years ago, but reread it for the book club and found thought that it was fun, but it had a lot of potential that didn't really pay off. Uh, that's a good way of putting it, I think. I, I agree with that. There's so many so many things I could see them doing interesting things with. Like, there's moments in this book where I was like, "Oh, so we're doing a thing where the the." the colonial forces are clearly the bad guys, right? Like that's, we're doing this thing. And then it's not that they're not, it's just that it doesn't matter to this story. Yeah. It's like, it, it's like, it doesn't follow through and it's, it's being left up to you to make certain conclusions perhaps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Kristen says uh, they read it in the past and they liked it enough that they actually read more of the series. And so I guess we should mention this is, I believe the first book in a series. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although I've heard that it's sort of um, not necessarily a series where it's like strict continuity. It's more like different adventures throughout this universe. But I don't actually... As in the anything. second book might not feature our, our, our protagonist, John. Mm -hmm. That is what I've heard. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what... That's, speaking of John, that's what John says. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, do we want to... Uh, do we want to... Enough of this. these overall thoughts? Do we want to jump into it. it seems like everyone is is on the same page here as far as what we thought of the book overall that sounds good to me let's do it all right so the first uh page is as usual the beginning of the book i did two things on my 75th birthday i visited my wife's grave then i joined the army visiting kathy's grave was the less dramatic of the two She's buried in Harris Creek Cemetery, not more than a mile down the road from where I live and where we raise our family. Getting her into the cemetery was more difficult than perhaps it should have been. Neither of us expected needing the burial, so neither of us made the arrangements. It's somewhat mortifying, to use a rather apt word, to have to argue with the cemetery manager about your wife not having made a reservation to be buried. Eventually, my son, Charlie, who happens to be mayor, cracked a few heads and got the plot. Being the father of the mayor has its advantages. So, the grave. Simple and unremarkable, with one of those small markers instead of a big headstone. As a contrast, Kathy lies next to Sandra Kane, whose rather oversized headstone is polished black granite, with Sandy's high school photo and some maudlin quote from Keats about the death of youth and beauty sandblasted into the front. That's Sandy all over. It would have amused Kathy to know San Sandra was parked next to her, with her big dramatic headstone. All their lives, Sandy nurtured an entertainingly passive-aggressive competition with her. Kathy would come to the local bake sale with a pie. Sandy would bring three and, and simmer, not so subtly, if Kathy's pie sold first. <laughs> Kathy would attempt to solve the problem by preemptively buying one of Sandy's pies. It's hard to say whether this actually made things better or worse from Sandy's point of view. I suppose Sandy's headstone could be considered the last word in the matter, a final show-up that could not be rebutted, because, after all, Kathy was already dead. On the other hand, I don't actually recall anyone visiting Sandy. <laughs> Three months after Sandy passed, Steve Kane sold the house and moved to Arizona with a smile as wide as Interstate 10 plastered on his skull. He sent me a postcard some time later. He was shacking up with a woman down there who had been a porn star 50 years earlier. I felt unclean for a week after getting that bit of information. Sandy's kids and grandkids live one town over, and they might as well be in Arizona for as often as, the, as they visit. Sandy's Keats quote probably hadn't been read by anyone since the funeral, but me, in passing, as I move the few feet over to my wife. All right, so here is the beginning of the book, Matt. Um, th there's a few things I want to talk about here. The one is the writing style, which is, as we kind of see here, long paragraphs, um, well thought out. I think, you know, if you, if you pay attention to the book and as I was thinking of this, John, um, said it in chat that as he transitions from being an old man to a younger man, I think the paragraphs get a little shorter. I think that's one thing that Scalzi does is kind of change a little bit. I, I will say, I will say that I think one of my problems with this book is all characters I feel have the same voice. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, maybe that's just because it's a first person thing. So the, the separate characters' voices got lost. But I, I just had a, a, like, I, if all the characters felt kind of samey to me in a lot of ways. Like, there's multiple times throughout the story that characters will like break down and explain the physics of certain things to you. And it was different characters each time, but the explanations sounded the same and felt the same. Um, yeah. Along those lines, I'll say that if you ask me to name sort of uh, John's friends or like tell me what they did in the, in the book, I'd just be like, I don't know. I remember Alan because Alan was his like closest buddy um, who died on uh, Coral. And then Maggie was the one he loved. She was the first one to die, I'm pretty sure. Loved. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- that's the thing. I'll just kind of remember them as like a bunch of a bunch of faceless people who all died in tragic ways and we don't spend much time with any of them maybe that's the point matt Uh, i I think that is the i think that basically is the point like like we spend so much time with john and then everybody else is just transiently flitting in and out of his life and Mm -hmm. i think that's part of making him you know isolated and and um sort of changing rapidly like i think that, that that is one thing that i think i like about the book is like this introduction is so like um, like it, it's like a 75 year old man who's been living his entire life in a, in a sleepy town. Yeah. Like he's just going on this mental digression about his, the, the grave of the, of the woman next to his wife in, in detail and kind of making little, little jokes, you know, little, little knowing winks to you. Yeah. And then by the end, he's like a completely different person. Um, he is, you know, a much more, you know, mission oriented sort of, sort of utilitarian, violent person he doesn't he doesn't really go on these humorous interludes uh, at least i don't think he does i might be wrong um not as much but, no no yeah um I, one of the things i wanted to point out here though is i mean obviously the, the first sentence the first sentence is pretty it it's you can almost see the concept of the book came out of this first sentence right i did two things on my 75th birthday i visited my wife's grave and then i joined the army like there's it, that's delicious right mm-hmm. um and, and i think it's important that which one comes first, obviously, as I visited my wife's grave. And then we go on this, it goes on from here. There's actually more to John visiting Kathy's grave than just these three paragraphs we have here. Um, The, uh, I I think it shows that the, the main priority of the book obviously has the, the story has John going through this army stuff, but like in John's mind, it's all about his wife and it's constantly about his wife. And I think this helps kind of explain the, the third act shift of the novel that goes from the soldier experiencing the horrors of war to him having a focus and like finding, uh, I forgot Jane, I think is Kathy's new Mm -hmm. name and finding Jane. And like the whole, the whole focus of the novel, like pivots around this discovery and that that's what it becomes from then on. And I think this is kind of laying the groundwork for that because we spend the very, very first part of the novel, not talking about the army stuff. We get to that later. It's first and foremost, it's about Kathy. Yeah, this seems to be the one thing that kind of sets him apart from the other, you know, old folks who joined the, the army with him mm-hmm. is um, the fact that he's lost his wife and that he's sort of still grieving, actually. Like, yeah. I think that's one thing that I, I, well, assuming that I'm right about this, I like it. Um, he seems, he, because he has this kind of ironic, detached humor about everything, he doesn't really outwardly seem to be grieving. But I think just the the amount that he thinks about his wife and the impact it has on him when he finds her or when he finds the clone later, that really shows you that that he's kind of been messed up about this the whole time. You can almost, again, maybe I'm reading between the lines or reading things into the book that I want to be there, (laughs) but I almost feel like his willingness to join the army and not really care when they're like, you're probably going to die is he's like, I don't care if I die. Like, like he's, mm-hmm. he's kind of done. Um, again, I don't know if you had that takeaway. No, I think so. I mean, I think we have a slide on it, but when he goes through the psychological test, what, what do they, what do they decide is the most effective way to go at him? It's through his wife. I do think there's an interesting thing. I, I don't know if the book ever tells us how many people, like what percentage of old people do this thing. But there's this this real feeling that I think when they turn 65 and when they both signed up for this thing at 65, they kind of thought that they weren't going to have to lose each other, right? And I think in, right. in, in John's mind, 
mourning his wife was something he was never going to have to do. They made this decision together. They weren't sure on it, but they eventually made it together. And, and they, I, we see later, they talked about, yeah, we're going to get separated and, but we'll find each other, which is of course exactly what they do. But I just like, I think he's not prepared for that kind of loss. And I wonder, like, it just seems so unique in this world that like none of the other applicants have something like that. They just, they just don't like, they yeah. they maybe have wives or husbands um or or family but they've all made peace with the fact that they've lost them because it it happened almost via choice whereas her, she was taken from him in a way that is probably much more rare in this world now that's what it seemed like to me as well so yeah. it, it it also seems like their their lives all seem to be much more boring than you would expect for a 75 year old as if like as if the whole world had stagnated and everyone was just kind of living in a very static and, and, and stagnant fashion. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting how little we understand about what is happening on earth. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we know they have, they have some advanced technology through the, the, uh, colonial forces, but they don't know anything about it. Um, we know that there was a war, right? There was a big war um, with India and it, it ended with those people being just nuked off the face of the planet um, mm. or at least nuked so much that they allow them to join the military, which is, <laughs> in retrospect is like a hilarious thing. Like earlier in the novel, they're like, you have the one clearly racist guy complaining about, it's not fair that we have to wait till we're 75 and they get to go when they're like 20. And then the more you learn about this life, it's like, oh wait, no, that's actually like a punishment of being conquered and not like a benefit that these people get. Yeah, right. Well, and, and even that, I don't know. If, I don't know if I would say we necessarily understand that so much as we're just like, oh, that's interesting. I hope we learn more about about this process of the 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 Indians being used as colonists. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, no, no. You're never going to hear about that again. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, all right. You want to move on to this next slide? Sure. So the next slide is John signing up for the army, and I, I like this. Um, for a few reasons that we'll get into, but let me let me go ahead and read it first. Very good, she said. Paragraph one. I, the undersigned, acknowledge and understand that I have freely and of my own will and without coercion volunteering to join the Colonial Defense Forces for a term of service of not less than two years in length. I additionally understand that the term of service may be extended unilaterally by the Colonial Defense Forces for up to eight additional years in times of war and duress. This ten years total extension clause was not news to me. I did read the information I was sent once or twice, although I wondered how many people glossed over it. And of those who didn't, how many people actually thought they'd be stuck in the service 10 years? My feeling on it was that the CDF wouldn't ask for 10 years if it didn't feel it was going to need them. Because of the quarantine laws, we don't hear much about colonial wars, but what we do hear is enough to know it's not peacetime out there in the universe. I signed. Paragraph 2. I understand that by joining the... By volunteering to join the Colonial Defense Forces, I agree to bear arms and to use them against the enemies of the Colonial Union, which may include other human forces. I may not, during my term of service, refuse to bear and use arms as ordered or cite religious or moral objections to such actions in order to avoid combat service. How many people volunteer for an army and then claim conscientious objector status? I signed. Paragraph 3. I understand and agree that I will faithfully and with all deliberate speed execute orders and directives provided to me by superior officers as provided for in the Uniform Code of Colonial Defense Forces Conduct. I signed. Paragraph 4. I understand that by volunteering for the Colonial Defense Forces, I consent to whatever whatsoever medical, surgical, or therapeutic regimes to pr or procedures are deemed necessary by the Colonial Defense Forces to enhance combat readiness. Um, so... This is the reason I pulled this slide. This is something I want to talk to you about how the book handles its exposition, mm -hmm. because I think in some ways it does like this to me is very clever because this is kind of telling us all of how this works. It's, it's basically all exposition, but it's doing it in a way that kind of gets you to understand that this is just going to be the military. Like this is just going to be the military. This is what it is. The language here, the, the, the ways that they're leaving out certain things, um, the ways that they're covering their bases in certain ways. And while teaching us how this whole, how this whole thing is going to work. Mm -hmm. I think there's some ways in which the book succeeds less at some of its exposition. I think some of our conversations with the physicists that are just like, ah, let me explain this to you, sir. And go on for pages and pages and pages about warp drives and and the beanstalk and, and things like this um yeah it doesn't feel as smooth but this to me felt really really good i mean i i, I think um 
the thing about those later bits that that frustrate me is that I feel like they're building towards something that we never reach. Mm -hmm. But but I did love this. Like this in particular is great because like as as she goes through each paragraph, more and bigger red alarm bells are going off in my head. <laughs> and and it's all like it's all giving you this terrible, you know, premonition of like what this is actually going to be like where yeah. he's like okay, you're you're almost definitely going to be locked in for 10 years. This whole this nonsense about Two years, unless we really need you, is obviously a, like a trick, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, a very transparent trick. And and then and then it's like, j just to go through all of them rapidly, it's like, yeah, you may have to kill other people. That may happen. Probably going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, you can't object to any orders that are given to you. So if you're ordered to, say, massacre a bunch of people, you have to do that. Uh, and you'll probably be shot if you if you refuse. Um, let's see next, uh, you, you have to follow orders basically, meaning you have to follow whatever orders they give, even if they're horribly immoral. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is, uh, you can do whatever you want to my body, mm -hmm. just whatever you want with no limits whatsoever, medical, surgical, or therapeutic regime. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it is literally like the gamut it's whatever you want to do to me you can do and like it's so funny because at this point john's reaction to this is this is the paragraph that makes everyone sign it's this one because they're promising us some form of extended life uh -huh. um i think one of the interesting questions that this book poses is here's an ability you old man to get another chance at life to be young again and and to live again and i think I think the book at first wants you to say, fuck yeah, absolutely. And then I think by the end of it, it wants you to go, well, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah. Um, not, not really worth it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, although, I don't know. I <laughs> I, I want to be a green dude. I, I think like, the, the, I think, I don't know if Scalzi nailed it quite enough to me. To, to that it's not worth it because like i don't know we'll get to the last slide but the last slide is like i get another chance with my wife and it's hopeful and i'm sure the later books will just destroy that but i don't know this is this is what i mean by i just i was so convinced that i thought i knew where the story was going and it even for a while it even seems like it's going that direction but then it says okay we've covered that let's move on to something else and i was just like huh yeah okay. I, I guess i guess i here's here's where i agree is i thought it was going to be much worse like i thought like, for example, I thought from fairly early that the way they were going to get life extension was that their brains were going to be uploaded into computers or, or, or like Android bodies, mm -hmm. which would be very elderly anyway. And they probably weren't going to live that much longer. So at least they got to live that live out their last remaining years in kick ass green bodies um, before they died horribly. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like it does. Like you said, it, it's not like a slam dunk. Like, ah, oh, they. Uh, I'm sure they all regret their choice now. It's like, no, I don't think any of them regret their choice, actually. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, and and I don't know if anyone else, saw, like, my internet cut out while you were talking, so I don't know if that affected, I mean, assumingly that would have affected the stream, so apologies <laughs> for everyone that just had to experience that. But, yeah, I, I, I think that's what I, like, I don't know, and I think, the, I think the answer to all these questions are going to be, oh, he gets into these in the later books, which... Good is what I can say. Good, but um, <laughs> I, I still wanted it in this book. I really felt like I really, I really felt like that's where you we were going, yeah. like that it was just going to be absolutely the worst. Yeah, um, I don't know. Like that, that's the, that's the thing is it it ends up being very like fun, and you you're, you're kind of like into it. You're like, yeah, mm. this is awesome. Like. Like people in the chat have have brought up um, Starship Troopers a few times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and said that this book, in fact, seems to be intentionally mimicking some of the structural choices in Starship Troopers. And I haven't actually read Starship Troopers, but I, I thought the point was basically to talk about how it's like a like a horror of war thing. And this book spent a lot of time on the awesomeness of war, actually. So, I mean, yeah, there was some horror of war stuff in there, too. I just don't know. I, I would say I would say the Starship Troopers the novel is much less specifically just about the horrors of war. I think I think there there certainly is some of that. Heinlein Heinlein's a, a complicated man, right? Um he yes. he was very much into 
I'm not going to say he was like pro fascism because I don't think he was, but he was definitely pro like strong, powerful military stuff, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So I I don't, I don't think, I don't think it was, I mean, I think you can read that into that book and it's, it's there if you want to pick up on it, but a lot of Starship Troopers is just Johnny Rico, like um, speaking out loud or, or, or just like via hundreds of pages of text talking about how fucking awesome he is and how awesome the military is and all this. Um, Yeah. So I I almost think to, to John's point, this is taking the structure of that book but I thought exposing exposing it through a different kind of theme, a theme of, mm-hmm. oh, no, actually, all that stuff is terrible. And, I, like, the thing is, that's totally there, right? Like, we're the whole second section of the book is, like, oh, this is this is monstrous and terrible. Like, they have our characters break up a, a, a strike, basically, and just murder colonists that are striking. And, mm-hmm. like, it's very clearly not a good thing, but... It's just, and, and maybe, again, maybe this is part of the point that our character just doesn't comment on it, that it's really not the point that we have one kind of moment where we say, yeah, um, this is bad, but the way to solve it is by surviving, following orders, getting up in the ranks, and then fixing it when you're in charge. Oh, wait, that person died. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, so, I mean, I just, again, I, I, I feel like I thought the climax of the book was going to have these these feelings these themes face our protagonist like directly confront our protagonist and that's really not what the book does yeah actually force the protagonist to make some kind of choice along yeah. those lines um or something like that or, yeah. or make us feel like there was some more level of clarity there like and okay so obviously it's awful when they have to go massacre colonists and and like it, it shows you that there's like this dark underbelly to all this stuff that's mm-hmm. that's happening um, but like that, it feels like there's just too many different things going on. Like, yeah, that's happening. But then also like they seem to be in this almost like Warhammer 40 K like <laughs> hell universe where just everything's trying to kill them all the time. And they're, they're just desperately hanging on like the, the rate at which they're churning through soldiers is so steep that you could almost believe that they could just be wiped out. Yeah. See, this yeah. is. This is what I mean by the the book just feels like it's teeing something up and then it doesn't execute on it. Yeah. I was convinced when they're telling this grand story about like the colonies are the the, the last hope of civilization and the, the, we have to defend these people because it's like the only way humanity will survive and we have all these cultures surrounding us that all want us dead. I thought this was total indoctrination and the book kind of not in, not entirely but it kind of says it's true. Yeah, right. I, I think it would have been more like fun to me if if you gradually sort of realize that like humanity is has actually just been like crushingly slaughtering races in an ever expanding outward circle without resistance. I really thought that's where we were going. Like, I, I did too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're jumping. Little, we're jumping all ahead, but it's it's true. There was a fun little sidebar about the idea that um, was was John's consciousness actually copied or did he just. Uh, uh, or actually transferred, or did he just copy his mind and then and then kill his old body? And and of course, I think the latter. We got a whole um, slide about that, Matt. All right, all right, <laughs> all right. Next, next slide. Um, here we have John going through basic tests, including this psychological one. Did you like it being married? Sure, beats the alternative. He smirked. So what happened? Divorced? Fuck around one one time too many? Whatever obnoxious, amuse, obnoxiously amusing qualities this guy had were fading fast. She's dead, I said. Yeah? How did that happen? She had a stroke. Gotta love a stroke, he said. Bam, your, bra- your brain's skull pudding, just like that. Good that she didn't survive. She'd be this fat, bedridden turnip, you know? You'd have to, you'd, you'd just have to feed her through a straw or something. He made slurping noises. I didn't say anything. Part of my brain was figuring how quickly I could move to snap his neck. But most of me was just sitting there in blind shock and rage. I simply could not believe what I was hearing. Down in some deep part of my brain, someone was telling me to start breathing again soon or I was going to pass out. The colonial's PDA suddenly beeped. Okay, he said and stood up quickly. We're done. Mr. Perry, please allow me to apologize for the comments I made regarding your wife's death. My job here is to generate an enraged response from the recruit as quickly as possible. Our psychological models show that you would respond most negatively to comments like the ones I have just made. 
Please understand that on a personal level, I would never make such comments about your late wife. I blinked stupidly for a few seconds at the man. Then I roared at him. What kind of sick, fucked up test was that? I agree it is an extremely unpleasant test, and once again I apologize. I'm doing my job as ordered, nothing more. Holy Christ, I said. Do you have any, any idea how close I came to breaking your fucking neck? In fact, I do, the man said in a calm, controlled voice that indicated that, in fact, he did. My PDA, was just, which was tracking your mental state, beeped right before you were about to pop. But even if it hadn't, I would have known. I do this all the time. I know what to expect. So this is really a perfect, I mean, I, I want I want to use this as a catch-all to like talk about the, the basic physical and mental tests they put them through before they do the body transfer, but this is a really great way of kind of laying the groundwork for this is a place in which people just follow orders no matter what. It, it, that includes if your entire job is just day in and day out having to drive people to the the edge of their psychological limit right before they're about to snap and try to beat the shit out of you. Like, imagine what it takes for a 75-year-old man to be like, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Right. <laughs> it's just wild. Um, and so that's yeah. what I loved about this is like, the, I think this does a really good job of, again, in my, in my thought at the time, setting up the themes for what we're doing here that look at this, here's this guy, here's, this is what he does. This is his job to do this. And he hates it. Like, you can tell he hates it. Like, because he's immediately apologetic as soon as the test is over. But yeah. he does it anyway. Right. It's it's extremely dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the, the whole process of, of how they're sort of tested. Um, uh, uh, Slipper Jam in the chat says that the, the whole idea of the consciousness transfer, which is what they are preparing for right here, felt like just a trick aimed at letting the new soldiers believe that they weren't just mind clones, just harvesting the lifetime of memory of memories from the elderly. And, and I, I really do think that like that, that's the reading I got from it is, is like, this is a very inhuman, almost like industrial process where they're just, you know, making slightly better soldiers by harvesting the memories from the elderly and then putting them into these bodies and then using mm -hmm. them like cannon fodder. Sure. Like, and, and, and all, and, and the stuff like this test right here, this is like a perfect example where it's like, we don't really care what we have to do. We don't really care how inhumane and, and, and ridiculously evil this is. We just need to get a good copy of you. So we're going to yeah. say the meanest, most, most awful thing we can possibly say. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of like the tests they're doing on people, did you, I don't like, this is totally not supported by a text, but you remember Leon the racist mm -hmm. and how he died of a heart attack right before he was going to get uh -huh. tested. Do you think like it did that on purpose? <laughs> uh, maybe, crossed my mind. maybe they're just like, they're just monitoring this guy's conversation and they're like, mm, nah, pass. Yeah. I, I, the thought did occur, occur to me because I, I was like, I can imagine that there are there are people who sign up who they just don't really want in their army. Yeah. And they do seem fairly psychopathic about the way they conduct their like, um, I don't know, pretty much everything they do. So, yeah, I wouldn't put it past them to, to just kind of nix somebody who they didn't want to have to worry about. I will say if 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 Scalzi was trying to create the idea of that, he the better way to do it would have been to have him like go through some of the initial psychological tests first and then go oops heart attack yeah. <laughs> after right. that right um that would have made it the, the the potential for that a little bit more plausible than just right before the beginning part of the process mm -hmm. yeah yeah i like that but it, it i I'm, I'm glad that i'm not the only one that thought that um i want to circle back around to something miss evil doom said because i think doom you're 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 nailing it exactly and saying it better than i did actually uh they say i don't think the cdf being necessary and also being evil is mutually exclusive or even should be mutually exclusive but i do think that if you're going to have that intersection say something about it that's that's the whole thing right it's it's not that i'm saying that the book actually thinks that the cdf is good no i don't think that at all but i was just waiting for the moment where like that was that mattered in a way in a way to the to the story itself and and again i think i think what we're getting at is we keep going back to this thing. Well, maybe it's the point that didn't matter. It's the point that we're, we're seeing the story from a first person perspective of a character that's becoming completely indoctrinated into the system. And therefore at, at some point in the story, he just stops questioning any of these things. He just stops. Like, like there is this, this very real point. And like, again, to get, to get more sus as the kids say, um, isn't it interesting 
that the moment where he's 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 leading up to feeling the most disillusioned with this whole thing, bam, there's his wife again, right? Yeah, right. And and then past that point, there's no questioning at all, right? It's, yeah, it's yeah. just like he rearranges his whole life to try to pursue her and, and like, because th this is like the one shred of meaning that he has left. Mm -hmm. um, and then when that's done, he's just kind of like a CDF man through and through. Yeah. And we know they know that because as this slide here points out, they know his wife is like the, the path to his vulnerability, his psychological vulnerability. Yeah. I mean, I don't know when there's a better place to talk about this than here, but like, this is something you and I talked about over the course of the month was, was like, the, isn't it weird how many things work out for our protagonist or yeah. like how he's, how he, how he's sort of like always like special, but then n nothing is ever, that's never really explained. It just sort of is the case that he's special. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um I think there may be better slides to talk about that with, but, but, but that's one thing that comes up where it's like, things happen where it's just like, well, that's a little convenient. And then you're forced to be like, okay, well, was it arranged or is it just <laughs> convenient? Yeah. It's, <laughs> I, you, I you start, you start playing multiple levels of chess in your head to try to understand and make sense of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, there are better slides to talk about that, but I think it's, it's, that is important to bring up now that John is like the best soldier in the universe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, I, I like that Kristen says, honestly, I admit that I got a little swept up into, into it and didn't question it either until now. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is I think the book is, is it, it takes you for a ride. And because the bad guys that John comes up against are scary, a lot of them, not all of them, the poor, like whale, like people I just felt so bad for, but like the, a lot of them are scary. A lot of, and, and he's watching his friends die and, and uh, there's a speech late in the book. I didn't pull a slide on it, but there's a speech late in the book where John basically says, you know, I don't care about the orders. I don't care about the goal. I don't care about the colonists. All I care about are the people in my unit and keeping them safe and making sure that they make it through this. And that's how, like, that's very true. I think that's very accurate to how any military organization operates. And it's exactly how you get people to do whatever you want, right? You make them focus on just, 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 worry about each other don't worry about anything else and don't question it yeah right i mean i'm sort of trying to imagine like a story written from the perspective of like some soldier for the east india company yeah and and it's like uh, and it's like basically it would be a similar story where you know it's a story of bonding with his comrades mm -hmm. and you know shooting natives and 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 like everything would feel very justified to that character yeah um and I'm like, well, well, how do you better show the sort of dehumanizing effect of it than just being completely within that person's perspective and showing that they that it doesn't even occur to them? Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I, that I mean, that's that's spot on. I think. Um, interesting. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm saying all this stuff with a big like question mark <laughs> at the end of every sentence. Mm -hmm. So, so John in the chat thinks that the reason why John is, is sort of remarkable is simply that we have like a quantum immortality situation where from your own perspective, you're always going to have sort of a ridiculously um, um, lucky life because all of the other versions of you died, but you have, but, but, but you got, repl you get basically duplicated by the quantum ship jumping technology thing. This is all like that's the thing is like I'm willing to go with you there, John, in the chat, not John the protagonist, <laughs> but like but like we don't we don't really do anything with it, like if, if that's the idea then I guess it's good for a chuckle, but but that's it's certainly not like integral to the plot of the story right it's just a throwaway like 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 wink right. Yeah. Um. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like I I don't know what else to say other than yeah I mean it's it's a lot of fun ideas and I'm, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop like i'm just waiting 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 and it never drops and then the book ends and it's like oh okay so that didn't matter at all then okay yeah, that, or, or 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 i was just wrong he, yeah. he apparently is not even special in, in that way yeah. well yeah i mean oh gosh we gotta we gotta get into john's specialness okay. um but first let's talk about the actual transfer the actual the green guys right 
Now I want you to relax, Dr. Russell said to me. The colonials had wheeled in the younger me to the other creche, and they were in the process of placing the body into it. It, or he, or I, or whatever, offered no resistance. They might as well have been moving someone in a coma. Or a corpse. I was fascinated, and horrified. A small little voice in my brain told me it was good I had gone to the bathroom before I came in, or otherwise I'd be peeing down my leg. How? I began, and I choked. My mouth was too dry to talk. Dr. Russell spoke to one of the colonials, who left and returned with a small cup of water. Dr. Russell held the cup as he gave me the water to drink, which was good, because I don't think I could have managed to grip it. He spoke to me as I drank. How is usually the attached to one of two questions, he said. The first is, how did you make a younger version of me? The answer to that is that ten years ago we took a genetic sample and used that to make your new body. He took the cup away. A clone, I said finally. No, Dr. Russell said, not exactly. The DNA has been heavily modified. You can see the most obvious difference, your new body's skin. I looked back over and realized in the shock of seeing a younger version of me, I missed a rather obvious and glaring difference. He's green, I said. You're green, you mean, Dr. Russell said, or will be in about five minutes. So that's one how question. The second one is, how do you get me into there? He pointed to my green skin doppelganger. And the answer to that is, we're transferring your consciousness. Uh huh. <laughs> okay, so this is when you get to go on your vast conspiracy theories surrounding soma and and the transfer of consciousness blah 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 i mean it seems like based on the chat it's not a it's not a unique conspiracy theory <laughs> to me it's a, the idea being that they just copy his mind and then kill him um which again is the sort of thing that you wouldn't put past these colonial certainly uh, military people yeah um, i mean especially considering we know as we learn about the special forces later that they can construct that they don't need John at all, actually. Like, they just... His DNA is enough for them to construct a person, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Which, I mean, which raises... Here's here's the large question I have, Matt. Mm -hmm. If they can make people like Jane, where they just take the DNA of a person and then, like, combine it with some consciousness data from some other people and make a new person, what... Why did, why do they need all the old people? Like that's okay, the, and and this is this is where I begin to really get kind of annoyed with the story actually because it's like, what is this war that we're fighting, and why does it rely so heavily on infantry using rifles, to the extent, and and, and then, so like what like why don't why aren't okay why aren't we using robots number one, why aren't we using like orbital bombardment number two. Like, why are there so many engagements that have to be won by, like, dropping in strike teams with rifles? And and then if you're going to do that, then, yeah, just use, like, hundreds of thousands of these hyper-engineered uh, special forces soldiers who are strictly better than the <laughs> old people infantry. Yeah. Like, there's just, like, none, like, like, none of it makes sense to me. And to the extent that I'm like, what am I missing? Like, like what, what are we doing here? that i'm missing actually yeah i mean and, and i don't care about the robots thing i don't care about the orbital bombardments thing i, I don't care um i i i it, it seems like the book demonstrates that there's just a better version of them but then they're still there also and i don't like one thing that i think the book fails to do as i think doom is pointing out here we're told that 75 years worth of knowledge and skill and and all this stuff benefits the soldiers that that they make that a 75 year old in the body of a 20 year old is a better soldier than a 20 year old in the body of a 20 year old. Right? Like that's the argument that the book is making. I don't think it ever actually succeeds in making that argument like outside of just telling us that that's the case. Right? I don't there's there, to me. I mean, I guess you could say John is the argument, but but his it, then it's a really not unsuccessful uh-huh. one in my opinion but it's just the, like there's not there's no skill they have there no like there there's no advantage they have in com- yeah. like there's it just i it's just the book tells us that that's that's the case and and again maybe it's they're just lying maybe they're just lying and there's a whole reason for this and we find out in the other books but yeah. i don't know i mean the the drill sergeant instead says Man, I sure hope none of you were in the military. Then I have to, <laughs> I have to 
retrain all of your and it's like wait so like yeah. what 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 knowledge exactly did you think they were going to carry with them like and, <laughs> and, and then we see and then we see specific instances where like that that kind of politician guy tries to like give a speech to the aliens and gets gets melted by them mm-hmm and it's like that's an example of like an old man set in his ways thinking that he's going to be able to use those habits of mind to make a difference. And it's like, yeah. no, no. And, and you know, stuff like where John comes up with his shoot gun two times, not shoot gun one time, um, master stroke. That's not because he's a rifleman. That's no, he learned he, he, it's because he's a writer. He learned that he, in his tech in his career of writing ad copy. Exactly. He learned how to shoot the gun twice in his career of ad copy. <laughs> Um, John goes through a wonderful office space thing that the ghost brigades, they don't have the people skills that the, the green, the green guys do. Um, uh-huh. what do they, what do they got to use those for? <laughs> They're grunts in the military. Um, Chris says John does have a realization about the console having a sort of religion around fighting that the others missed. Yeah. I mean, that's true, but wh- why though? And, and why is he the only one who gets it like that? <laughs> It seemed kind of obvious. That's, I mean, that's, God, we, we, we're going to talk about, we have a whole slide about the double tap and that's what I want to talk about there. Okay. All right. Um, let's, let's get to the double tap. Okay. Well, we got, we got to go let's through. get through 115 slides and then we're going to get to the double tap. All right. Next <laughs> it's not, slide. It's one slide. Two, wait, two right. slides. Two slides. So here, uh, the old farts meet up in their new bodies and reveal the names of their brain pals. Stop flirting, you two, Alan said and turned his attention to Maggie. I think you're right about the attraction thing, but I think you're forgetting the one person we're supposed to be the most attracted to, ourselves. For better or worse, these bodies we're in are still alien to us. I mean, between the fact that I'm green and I've got a computer named Dipshit in my head, he stopped and looked at all, and looked at us all. What did you name your brain pals? Asshole, I said. Bitch, said Jesse. Dickwad, said Thomas. Fuckhead, said Harry. Satan, said Maggie. Sweetie, said Susan. Apparently, I'm the only one who likes my brain, pal. More like you were the only one who wasn't disturbed by having a voice suddenly appear in your skull, Alan said. But this is my point. Suddenly becoming young and having massive physical and mechanical changes takes a toll on one's psyche. Even if we're glad to be young again, and I know I am, we're still going to be alienated from our new selves. Making us look good to ourselves is one way to help us get settled in. These are crafty people we're dealing with, Harry said with ominous finality. Oh, lighten up, Harry, Jesse said, and gave him a little nudge. You're the only person I know who would turn being young and sexy into a dark conspiracy. You think I'm sexy? Harry said. All right, so <laughs> there's a few things here. Uh-huh. I love that they all named their brain pals funny thing. This is this is the only like old crotchety people moment in the whole book to me where these people feel like old people. That they just look at this new computer and they're like, this fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah. And that they all do it. I think that there's that that is one moment that I really appreciate the old farts and that they feel like old farts. Uh-huh. But it's the only time that they feel like old people. I mean, that's like, that's the thing is like, I'm going to make a Benjamin Button comparison here, Matt. Here I go. Um, <sighs> in Benjamin Button, the movie, by the time he is young, he's a young man with an old brain, right? And he acts mm-hmm. like that. Brad Pitt, whatever you think about the movie aside, and I know you don't like the movie, whatever you think about the movie aside, he ha- he acts like an old man in a young body. And I feel like with scenes like this aside, there's very few moments in this book where I feel like they're acting like old men and women in younger bodies. Yeah. Again, you could say that it's like because they – they basically do revert when they get their younger bodies, but sure. But, but then, but then you, then you're like, then what was the point? You know? Um, yeah, exactly. If the whole point is that you flip a switch, they're young now and then they just act young for the rest of the thing. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's funny cause this part of the book was throwing so many ideas at you that I think I, I think certain of them just went under my radar, but now that we're being all, cynical and conspiratorial like the idea that they they basically get put into a new body and that new body has like a, a thought monitoring and thought influencing um ai in it seems extremely uh bad i guess like yeah like 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 how do we know that this isn't subtly influencing their thoughts constantly right 
Yeah, I mean, they get to a point where they don't even need to talk to their brain right. pal anymore, and their brain pal just knows what they want. Does it? Does it know what they want, or does it know what it wants them to know yeah. what they want? Because it seems logical to me that you would have like both both read and write capabilities if you had something like that. <laughs> it's fun being conspiratorial with this. Um, all right, let's talk about the indoctrination happening. Okay. We're having it drilled in our, into our heads that we're not even really humans anymore, she said. And if that's the case, why should we feel any attachment to the colonists? They're only human, after all. Why not breed CDF soldiers as the next step in human evolution and give ourselves a leg up? Don't think you're the first one to ask that question, Oglethorpe said, and this got a general chuckle. The short answer is, we can't. All the genetic and mechanical fiddling that gets done to CDF soldier renders them genetically sterile. Because of the common genetic material used in the template of each of you, there are far too many lethal recessives to allow any fertilization process to get very far. And there's too much non-human material to allow successful crossbreeding with normal humans. CDF soldiers are an amazing bit of engineering, but as an evolutionary path, they're a dead end. This is one reason why none of you should be too smug. You can run a mile in three minutes, but you can't make a baby. In a larger sense, however, there's no need. The next step of evolution is already happening. Just like the Earth, most of the colonies are isolated from each other. Nearly all people born onto a colony stay there their entire lives. Humans also adapt to their new homes. It's already beginning culturally. Some of the oldest of the colony planets are beginning to show linguistic and cultural drift from their cultural and languages back on Earth. In 10,000 years, there will be genetic drift as well. Given enough time, there will be as many different human species as there are colony planets. Diversity is the key to survival. Metaphysically, maybe you should feel attached to the colonies because, having been changed yourself, you appreciate the human potential to become something that will survive in the universe. More directly, you should care because the colonies represent the future of the human race, and changed or not, you're still far closer to human than any other intelligent species out there. But ultimately, you should care because you're old enough to know that you should. That's one of the reasons the CDF selects old people to become soldiers, you know. It's not just because you're all retired and a drag on the economy. It's also because you've lived long enough to know that there's more to life than your own life. Most of you have raised families and have children and grandchildren and understand their value of doing something beyond your own selfish goals. Even if you've never become colonists yourself, you still recognize that human colonies are good for the human race and worth fighting for. It's hard to drill that concept into the brain of a 19-year-old, but you know from experience. In this universe, experience counts. But then, but then why are the Ghost Brigade so much better than them? <laughs> good question. I mean, that, that, uh, part of the reason why I pulled this slide, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I don't, I just don't know if I'm supposed to take this at face value or if I'm supposed to reject it because it kind of makes sense, right? It, yeah, like, there's a like logic not, to it. There's a logic to it. You, you could, you could buy that, like, I mean, yeah, why, why should I fight for the colonies if they're, if I'm so disconnected from them? Like, well, you're, you know, when you're an old person, you see the value in, in your own society, even if you're, if, even if you're not going to get to enjoy the fruits of that because you're old. Um, that makes sense. But they're so disconnected from this society because they're all earthlings that because of the the whole the laws around um, not telling anyone on Earth anything that's happening in the universe, they don't know anything about any of this. Also, another thing that, that came to me while we were doing, you know, this this section was like, OK, in 10,000 years, it is not going to be humanity against the aliens. It's going to be all these different human subspecies against each other like like it, sure. it, you, even if you win and then you have like incommensurably different human races uh unless you have like a, a universe-wide tyranny keeping them all in line which i guess is what the cdf could could be eventually yeah, yeah. uh then then they're gonna fight each other and then yeah i mean which is what we have always done obviously um, it's not like it's not like shared humanity keeps us from killing each other. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely true. Uh, Doom says maybe the Ghost Brigades are just better at stabbing. That's the only thing they're better at. <laughs> and Kristen says I'd give up being a people person to be better at stabbing, especially yeah, in this I mean, world. Sh sure. So so that is one like you know response that I actually buy is like the I don't think the Ghost Brigades folks are like making command decisions because they are children and they don't have that kind of like just experience with the way the universe is. Yeah. But if they let them live long enough, then they could acquire it. Well, and I mean, they're, they're bred to like, there's this whole conversation that goes on between John and the other soldiers, the, the ghost brigade soldier, where he's like, he asks him why he fights. 
and the ghost brigades guy like like because there's literally nothing else because i've been bred for fighting like that's what Mm -hmm. i that's all there is in my life that's all i do and it seems like from a military perspective those it's better to have that guy but i mean maybe one of the arguments the book is trying to make that a person like john who has hope for something beyond the fighting is what allows them to live through it but again Mm -hmm. if that's the point it's trying to make it does it so subtly and subtextually that i don't actually see it unless i squint really hard yeah you know i don't know if this would solve any problems but i I think it would have been fun if if they revealed at some point like oh yeah well we only have like a hundred of these cloning chambers and we we stole them from some alien we don't know how to make them i mean that that's that would be in line with the other stuff we see right yeah yeah and and then and then you would be like oh so like this is like the reason this whole thing self-perpetuates is that no one even is doing technology development. They're just using tools that they've picked up lying around and using them to kill each other. Yeah. Um, which, which would go in with the themes to, to the extent that I understand the themes. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, cause yeah. like, and it would also explain why they don't have way more clones. Right. I, I, again, I'm, I'm like, this is just my like hasty patch job. Um, they kind of make sense. They kind of wink at the idea that, um, they they say that in war they're always going to be like the most cost efficient solution right and so like they're just like this what we're seeing right here is the most cost efficient solution to to war right um which i guess allows you to get out of any questions like this like you can make the assumption that the ghost brigade soldiers just cost more and are just not practical on that large of a scale i guess um i guess yeah I mean, I think I think you're right. Maybe I've been too hard on in, in, in this particular way where it's like, yeah, the reason it, it it is sort of ridiculous to think that you would be using infantry with rifles in a in a space colony war. Mm-hmm. But like the point is that it's it's cheap to train and equip an infantry person with a rifle cheaper than to, you know, use a I don't know. Uh, but that's the thing. I don't really believe that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know. Um, I don't know. There, there's a lot of chat happening. Um, John says the ghost brigades have less than stellar opinions of other humans, even in this book. Imagine having so many of them that they could overpower the rest of the CDF and take over it. Yeah, I mean, that's possible. I, there's nothing in this book that makes me think that they would even want to do that. They just like, they don't seem like they want anything besides, you know, to fight things. Yeah. Right, I'm just give them a little chip in their brain that that blows up their head if they start thinking mutinous <laughs> thoughts. Like, 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 like we're not beyond that sort of thing, right? So. Sure, sure. All right, um, it's time for your two shot firing solution, Matt. All right, Here my favorite go. part. All right, uh, in the first battle ever, John Perry solves the problem of personal shields before anyone else. <laughs> it took two shots to bring down a Kansu soldier. This was new. None of the intelligence on them mentioned personal shielding but something was allowing them to take the first hit. It sprawled them on whatever you might consider to be their ass, but they were up again in a matter of seconds. So, two shots. One to take them down, and one to keep them down. Two shots in sequence on the same moving target is not easily accomplished when you're firing across 100 meters of very busy battleground. After figuring this one out, I had Asshole create a specialized firing routine that that, that shot two bullets on one trigger pull, the first a hollow tip, and the second with an explosive charge. The specification was relayed to my MP between shots. One second I was squeezing off single standard issue rifle ammo, the next I was shooting my Kansu Killer Special. I loved my rifle. I forwarded this, this firing specification to Watson and Viveros. Viveros followed it, forwarded it up the chain of command. Within about a minute, the battlefield was peppered with the sound of rapid double shots, followed by dozens of Kansu puffing out as the explosive charges stained their internal organs against the insides of their carapaces. It sounded like popcorn popping. I glanced over at Viveros. She was emotionlessly sighting and shooting. Watson was firing and grinning like a boy who just won a stuffed animal at the State Farm BB shoot. Uh-oh, said Viveros. We're spotted, get down. What? Watson said and poked his head up. I grabbed him and pulled him down as the rocket slammed into the boulders we'd been using for cover. We were pelted with newly formed gravel. I looked up just in time to see a chunk of boulder the size of a bowling ball twirl madly down toward my skull. I swatted at it without thinking. The suit went hard down the length of my arm, and the chunk flew off like a lazy softball. My arm ached. In my other life, I'd be the proud owner of three new, short, likely terribly misaligned arm bones. 
I wouldn't be doing that again. Holy shit, that was close, said Watson. Shut up, I said, and sent to, sent to Viveros. What now? <sighs> okay. Uh huh. <laughs> how come he can? How come he comes up with this first? He like to to do Miss Evil Doom's credit. I do think that probably a minute later, someone else would have thought to do that. John was just lucky to get it first, right? Probably true. true. Probably true, right? Yeah. Uh, John even says this after the fact. He says someone else would have come up with it, and then the response is, "But no, you did." Why? Like, he, <laughs> yeah. I we were I, talking about. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say we were talking about this a little bit earlier, and I don't know if I like this, but I was thinking about the idea that like this. That think about it this way: maybe this is not supposed to even be that clever. Like this is just okay, whatever. You know, maybe tomorrow somebody else thinks of the clever thing first. It, it's just not that impressive. Sure. But then the thing is, John is the one who like survives you know, many unlikely things. And then you start looking for a reason and John starts looking for a reason and the commanders start looking for a reason why John has survived all of these things. And then like you, you part of you don't, doesn't want to believe in dumb luck. You want to believe, Oh, it's because he's special. It's because he's smart. It's because he's more competent. Hey, isn't he the guy who thought up with that? who thought up that clever firing solution. And then, and then it's like, yeah, yeah, he did think up that, super clever firing solution that that's an that's an example of his competency so like it, it's an interesting thing where it, it like at, at, in this moment this doesn't seem like that big of a deal but then like as the story goes it's like retroactively becomes a big deal and that's my attempt to justify why that is sure yeah i mean like i am i am not usually the person that complains about these things like i i love um kavoth and and i love like he's hyper competent in um, King Killer Chronicles, right? And that's part of the story. And I actually think the story is doing something very intentional with that. Um, I just, it feels like to me that the book spent a long time kind of explaining how, how much experience matters and how green these guys are. And then like, I just don't like the, 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 the twist here is that you have to shoot them twice. <laughs> like, so you're telling me that someone that's been on the battlefield for years didn't go, oh, just I I just made my gun shoot two times in succession. I just I just do that before the incredibly green, no pun intended, um, guy who's on the battlefield for the very first time. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't even like like okay. So this is the kind of thing I was thinking about because I like guns. Is I was like, this wouldn't even work. Okay, <laughs> like, 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 like. Okay, the, there is such a thing in real guns, in real um, military rifles, as like a three burst shot option, where you flip a thing and then you pull the trigger and the gun just goes pow, pow, pow. Yeah, okay? yeah. And that's useful in scenarios where you want to just be putting a ton of bullets out into the area <laughs> because because shit's crazy in in war, but like your first shot is only is going to be the only one that's remotely accurate. And when you're, when you're trying to fire over long distances, the first shot hits and then the second one is going to go high. So unless their guns have like some magic, you know, recoilless capacity, which maybe is in there and yeah. I just forgot about it. I mean, they clearly do because they're magic guns. I mean, they are magic guns and you, and, and that, you know, I, I, I kind of have to be like, yeah, fine. I guess they're magic guns that are recoilless, but here's the thing. If they're recoilless, then why can't you just aim the gun and go pop, pop twice? What well, like, like what's, <laughs> like, what's the fuck? <laughs> what's so special about this solution? If, if you could just fire your gun twice in rapid succession. Yeah. I mean, their guns are basically the lawgiver from judge dread, right? And they can yes. do whatever you want. See, like the idea yes. of to, like, it just seems like not that like Michael is saying hyper competent luck. The older soldiers are not that much older. They die too often. Yes. But also the book takes the time to say, even having survived one battle in this world is giving you so much experience. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so like incalculable amount of experience that like makes everyone immediately respect you. And I don't know, like I'm quibbling here. The problem is not like it, this didn't bother me in the moment. It bothered me after an entire book, of this continuously happening to John. Like, I think the most egregious example of this is at the end, and I pulled a slide for it, but I'm going to talk about it now, where he's just helping Jane, and then he just looks down, oh, is that a, 
Is that an SD card? Huh. Let me let me just plug uh-huh. that. Oh wait, it's the schematics to the thing. Huh. Huh. <laughs> That's exactly what I needed. <laughs> yeah. He's the only one who would have noticed. I mean, I, I <laughs> so if we're reading between the lines again, like I do like the idea that you know th- this is sort of like a war movie trope where like the, the characters are, are in a couple of battles and then they go see the new recruits which was what they looked like at the beginning of the mm-hmm, movie mm-hmm. and and then except now the new recruits are being played by like 14 year olds to like show the gap between them and it's like they 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 haven't gained experience in the sense of like learning a bunch of stuff but they're just like hardened in this ineffable yeah. way and and then also the new recruits see them as like demigods in a way that they don't really deserve sure like just because you've been shot at once doesn't mean you deserve this this respect because there's nothing that means you're not going to get killed in the next battle so yeah i do think it allows you to have more of a, a clearer head like i mean i think the the perfect example here is john versus this guy watson who is a fucking idiot and dies immediately in this battle. Like I, I, and, and to a certain extent, like the reason is because he's the protagonist and that's like, if he did, if he wasn't clever, he wouldn't survive. And then there wouldn't be a story, but like, I don't know. Like, I guess I just, I kept, it just, it kept happening. Like he was the clever one. And I, it, maybe it would have just been nice to see like, someone else come with another solution like this starts back when he's at at basic training right where he kind of single-handedly comes up with the the brain pal method that actually everyone uses but he's the only one in the whole squad that that thought of it and uh, the thing i was thinking of around this was this idea that like the reason he becomes platoon leader is stupid (laughs) because Uh it's like it's because the drill sergeant like loved his commercial and his commercial got him through <laughs> difficult times back in the days, the jingle he wrote for a commercial. Uh-huh. And so he's like, so you be my platoon leader. And then he's good at it. And then he gets better. And he, he get so like, I, I wonder in my mind, I wonder if it's a commentary on like you rise to the level of competence expected of you. And he's more competent than everyone else around him because he's been given the opportunity to be so because he's been uh-huh. treated as more competent than everyone around him. Um, for- for totally random reasons. Yes. I, I like that. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. For totally like, there's no rhyme or reason for it. It's just stupid. And I like that. I, that's the only kind of, it's the only way I can get around my head of maybe what it's trying to say with this. Uh, I like that too. Cause see, I was going to take it conspiratorially and say, maybe he was identified by their computers as being like a better soldier. And so they found an excuse to put him in power, but I actually like your explanation much better where it's mm-hmm. just like, there's literally no reason <laughs> And then that shaped him into being, you know, more reliable because he was given the chance. Yeah. And everybody else was just killed. John is pointing um, out like how actually bad the commercial jingle, like there's a jingle in a commercial. Sometimes you just got to hit the road, which is like, yeah, it's like super bad. There's nothing clever about it at all. This, I think I'm, I'm leaning into this more that John is just competent because they treated him that way and no other reason. Uh huh. I mean, it's also it's also kind of funny to imagine that like this is a guy whose like whole life, up to, up until this point even, was defined by the fact that he wrote this one jingle that caught on. <laughs> yeah, I mean or, that's what that's what like like made his career, right? Yeah, this is what made his career in real life, and he's still writing the success of the stupid jingle. So I, I really do love that as an example of like basically fundamentally und- undeserved success where the guy just says like, well, I, I guess I must deserve this if I'm, if I'm getting it. Otherwise <laughs> I have to accept that the universe is unfair and arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love okay. it. That, that, that does make me happy. All right. Um, so now the book's going to start to get a little sad because the first of the old farts dies. Maggie's platoon was supposed to be part of the effort to take back an aluminum mine. 100 clicks out of Murphy temperance's made port. They never made it to the ground. On the way down, her troop transport hull was struck by an Ohu missile. It tore open the hull and sucked several soldiers into space, including Maggie. Most of these soldiers died instantly from the force of the impact or by chunks of the hull tearing into their bodies. Maggie wasn't one of them. She was sucked out into space above Temperance, fully conscious, her combat unitard automatically closing around her face to keep the air from vomiting out of her lungs. Maggie immediately messaged to her squad and platoon leader. What was left of her squad leader was flapping about in his descent harness. Her platoon leader wasn't much more help, but... He wasn't to blame. 
The troop ship was not equipped for space rescue, and was in any event gravely damaged and limping, under fire towards the closest CDF ship to discharge its surviving passengers. A message to the Dayton itself was likewise fruitless. The Dayton was exchanging fire with several Ohu ships and could not dispatch rescue, nor could any other ship. In non-battle situations, she was already too small a target, too far down Temperance's gravity well, and too close to Temperance's atmosphere for anything but the most heroic retrieval attempts. In a pitched battle situation, she was already dead. And so Maggie, whose smart blood was by now reaching its oxygen-carrying limit, and whose body was undoubtedly beginning to scream for oxygen, took her MP, aimed it at the nearest Ohu ship, computed trajectory, and unloaded rocket after rocket. Each rocket burst provided an equal and opposite burst of thrust to Maggie, speeding her towards Temperance's darkened nighttime sky. Battle data would later show that her rockets, propelled long spent, did indeed impact against the Ohu ship, dealing some minor damage. Then Maggie turned, faced the planet that would kill her, and like the good professor of Eastern religion she used to be, she composed Jisi, the death poem, in the haiku form. Do not mourn me, friends. I fall as a shooting star into the next life. Yeah. I mean, she she was obviously the most interesting character and should have been the protagonist. <laughs> but but the point is that the world is unfair, and so she uh-huh. dies. Yeah, I, I want to use this to, to re- kind of represent the, the total change in tone at the story from this point on where every few pages we just learn about a new member of the old farts that is dying and they die in usually pointless ways. Um, like I, I, I love in this writing, like battle data would later show her rockets propellant long spent did indeed impact against the Ohu ship dealing some minor damage, like mm-hmm. some minor damage there just cuts you. Right. Because it's like, it's not like she died. And then like in her last defiant moment, she like, blew up a ship that was about to run into another ship and kill right. it's just it's some some minor damage yeah scratch the hull a bit they yeah. probably didn't even notice yeah it's pointless it's just it's all yeah like you said it's pretty much all pointless um does one of them die fighting the colonists even is yes. that a is that yes. a thing that happens yeah and that strikes you as just like sickening because mm-hmm. you're like that these are the people that we're that you're all protecting. Yeah, they. I think one of them dies breaking up a strike with colonists. Um, isn't that the one that gets like eaten by a fish and like something horrible? I don't remember. One gets that. eaten by a fish and or, or some kind oh, of fish thing yes. and drowns like, like, terribly. Yeah, like tor- like tortured by the colonists, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, and and then, and then they yeah <laughs> they get then, horrible revenge on the colonists and yeah. it's like, oh my god, Jesus. <laughs> and then one uh, is just killed by terror moss. It's just pointless and sad. Yeah. 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 And and I mean, this is kind of when uh, at this point in in the book, I was like, okay, okay, I gotcha. I know what we're doing now. I know what we're doing. This is when we're starting to, to, to steer into the, the CDF is the baddies. I've got you. I've got your number book. And then it, it continues into the next slide when we have Bender the politician basically pointing out the flaws in this whole thing. And then Viveros says, yeah, he's, he's right. Which is this next slide, Matt. Yeah. All right. Uh, so here we go. Bender was right. You know, Viveros said to me on the way back to the Modesto about what I asked about the CDF being used too fast and too much. Viveros said about it being easier to fight than to negotiate. She waved in the general direction of the, of the weighty and home planet which was receding behind us. We don't have to do this, you know, knock these poor sons of bitches out of space and make it so they spend the next couple of decades starving and dying and killing each other. We didn't murder civilians today. Well, other than the ones that got bender, but they'll spend a nice long time dying from disease and murdering each other because they can't do much of anything else. It's no less than a genocide. We just feel better about it because we'll be gone when it happens. You never agreed with bender before. I said, that's not true. Vivero said, I said that he didn't know shit and that his duty was to us, but I didn't say he was wrong. You should have listened to me. If he'd have followed his fucking orders, he'd be alive now. Instead, I'm scraping him off the bottom of my foot. He'd probably say he died for what he believed in, I said. Vivera snorted. Please, she said. Bender died for Bender. Shit. Walking up to a bunch of people whose planet we just destroyed and acting like he was their friend? What an asshole. If I were one of them, I'd have shot him too damn real life people getting in the way of peaceful ideals i said vivero smiled if bender were really interested in peace instead of his own ego he'd have done what i'm doing and what you should do perry she said follow orders stay alive 
make it through our term of infantry service, join officer training and work our way up, become the people who are giving the orders, not just following them. That's how we'll make peace when we can. And that's how I can live with just following orders because I know that one day I'll make those orders change. She leaned back, closed her eyes and slept the rest of the way back to our ship. Luisa Viveros died two months later on a shithole ball of mud called deep water. So it doesn't work. <laughs> Nothing works. You're fucked. Well, Everyone's fucked. And, and, and the other thing, the other thing is like, I think in reality, even if you do make it into like the officer core, like what happens is you, you're going to get promoted on the basis of like calling successful shots. Nobody, nobody's going to get promoted on the basis of saying like, let's not attack actually. Mm hmm. Like that's not how militaries work. Sure. And so, 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 like the plan, I don't think, I don't think would even work at all. No, I mean, I, I don't think. Like we kind of see, like what she is telling Perry to do here is almost exactly what he does, right? Yeah. I, I forget how high up he gets. He gets to captain at least. Um. But it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't right. matter. He he doesn't care anymore. He's, yeah. He's uh, you know. Yeah. As John is saying, the rest of the book is proving Viveros wrong. Yeah, but which is I, I think is totally true. But to what to what end? I mean, I guess I guess the conclusion is it's all fucked. <laughs> yeah. The end. The end. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> all right, Matt. It's time to talk about some skip drives. Okay. First off, the universe you're in, the universe we're in right at this moment, is only one of an infinite number of possible universes whose existence is allowed for within quantum physics. Every time we spot an electron in a particular position, for example, our universe is functionally defined by that electron's position, while in alternate universes, the electron's position is entirely different. You following me? Not at all, said Ed. You non-scientists. Well, just trust me on it then. The point is, multiple universes. The multiverse. What the skip drive does is open a door to another one of those universes. How does it do that? I asked. You don't have the math for me to explain it to you, Alan said. So it's magic, I said. From your point of view, yes, Alan said. But it's well allowed in physics. I don't get it, Ed said. We've been through multiple universes then, yet every universe we've been in has been exactly like ours. Every alternate universe I ever read about in science fiction has major differences. That's how you know you're in an alternate universe. There's actually an interesting answer to that question, Alan said. Let us take a get that it has given that moving an object from one universe to another is a fundamentally unlikely event. I can accept that, I said. In terms of physics, this is allowable, since it, it, at its most basic level, this is quantum physics, universe, and pretty much anything can happen, even if, as a practical matter, it doesn't. However, all other things being equal, each universe prefers to keep unlikely events to a bare minimum, especially above the subatomic level. How does the universe prefer anything? Ed asked. You don't have the math, Alan said. Of course not, Ed said, rolling his eyes. But the universe does prefer some things over others. It prefers to move towards a state of entropy, for example. It prefers to have the speed of light as a constant. You can modify or mess with these things to some extent, but they take work. Same thing here. In this case, moving an object from one universe to another is so unlikely that typically the universe to which you move the object is otherwise exactly like the one you left. A conservation of unlikeliness, you might say. So here you go, Matt. Here's your, your physics. Mr. So Mr. Inf Scientist. So it's the infinite improbability drive from uh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I guess so, but with a little more science in there? <laughs> maybe a little. Maybe we just have the word quantum thrown in. There you go. Yeah, I mean, whatever. It's 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 fine. I, 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 well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm literally just like, whatever. And then I'm like, okay, so is this supposed to be the reason why things happen in the story the way they do? Yeah, as Kristen's saying, this universe prefers our protagonist. I'm forced to assume that's the case, I guess, because because it's just it's it's weird, right? Like this is one of those things where I really did kind of sit with this after finishing the book and, and was like, what were we doing here? Because in Star Wars, we literally never explain how the hyperdrive works because it doesn't matter at all. Sure. OK. In a story where you're going to explain how your how your FTL drive works, usually there's a point like. In some stories, you you know it, it, it's a it's an FTL drive that's nonetheless still fairly slow, and then you have to at least throw in a line about like, well, yes, it, you know, it'll, it'll still be six months before we get there or whatever. And, and but like this is just like yeah, it's instant teleportation, basically. But then there's 
parallel universes, but that doesn't ever turn out to matter. Unless it secretly does matter. And so, so that, like, there's so many things in the story that are like that, where you're like, I don't know, I don't know what to do with this. Right. And it makes you think it's going to be, and, and like, to the book's credit, the skip drive does become plot relevant to the climax of the novel, but it, it's not the specific science of it that, that matters, right? It's that this other species has some sort of quantum detection device, which you could just say that. Yeah. You could, you could have it be totally different. You could just say like somehow they, you know, you could have it be, yeah, we open up wormholes and somehow they're able to detect our wormholes um, early. Mm -hmm. And no and one should be able to, to do explain. That. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, no one, no one should be able to do that. Oh, it's because of tachyons. Okay. Sure. Whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just going to support what John says and say that John is right, that that's why it's in the book because then it helps explain why John Perry is remarkable. Um, it, it, yeah. It, it makes, it makes the character the center of the universe. Yeah. 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 I, I agree with doom though, that, that I don't think there's enough textual evidence to support it, but you know, whatever. I like it. Yeah. Yep. All right. Shall we move on past this, sure. this foolishness? Um, <laughs> so now John bumps into his wife. Among the few possessions that I had taken with me when I left Earth was, was a digital fo photo album of family, friends, and places that I, that I loved. When my brain pal activated, I had uploaded the photos into its onboard memory, a smart move in retrospect since my photo album and all my other earthly possessions, but one, went down with the Modesto. I accessed one particular photo from the album and sent it to her. I watched as she accessed her brain pal and then turned again to look at me. Do you recognize me now? I asked. She moved fast, faster even than normal CDF, grabbed me and slammed me against a nearby bulkhead. I was pretty sure I felt one of my new newly repaired ribs crack. From across the commissary, Harry and Jesse leapt up and moved in. Jane's companions moved to intercept. I tried to breathe. Who the fuck are you? Jane hissed at me. And what are you trying to pull? I'm John Perry, I wheezed. I'm not trying to pull anything. Bullshit. Where did you get that picture? She said, up close, low. Who made it for you? No one made it for me, I said, equally low. I got that picture at my wedding. It's my wedding photo. I almost said our wedding photo and caught myself just in time. The woman in the picture is my wife, Kathy. She died before she could enlist. They took her DNA and used it to make you. Part of her is in you. Part of you is in that picture. Part of what you are gave me this. I held up my left hand and showed her my wedding ring, my only remaining earthly possession. Jane snarled, picked me up, and hurled me hard across the room. I skipped over a couple of tabletops, knocking away hamburgers, condiment packages, and napkin holders before coming to rest on the ground. Along the way, I clocked my head on a metal corner where uh, there was the briefest of oozes coming from my temple. Harry and Jesse disengaged from their wary dance with Jane's companions and headed over to me. Jane stalked toward me, but was stopped by her friends halfway across. Listen to me, Perry, she said. You stay the fuck away from me from now on. The next time I see you, there's, you, you next time I see you, you're going to wish I'd left you for dead. She stalked off. One of her companions followed after her. The other, who had spoken to me earlier, came over to us. Jesse and Harry got up to engage him, but he put his hands out in a sign of truce. Um, so here's here's Jane. Yep. Can we just say, first of all, that this is the worst way to confront <laughs> the person that has your wife's face and body and possibly memories? It, it is. I mean, so, so I saw this as a sign of how raw he still is about the death of his wife. Yeah, 100%. That, that the first time he sees her, he, he kind of freaks out, actually. Because like, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. This is, this is a terrible, terrible choice. <laughs> this is absolutely idiotic. But I think we're meant to, to see that, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's interesting that, like, the throughout the course of this book the cdf has successfully like beaten a lot of him, him out of himself right like he's kind of yeah. become this this grunt that this just follow orders don't question any of it like but this is the one thing they cannot get out of him mm -hmm. yeah um, the, the, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is this is his core personality trait is his love for his wife and you know he's it used to be that he would go visit her grave, you know, frequently, and mm -hmm. now he hasn't he hasn't done that in some time. And you can almost believe that he's sort of forgotten about her. But then he literally sees, you know, her apparently living, and 
and and you know I, I think someone understandably freaks out i i yeah i mean I, like if i if i had been married to my current wife for i think what 45 years he said how long they were married Something um like and then i just like saw her <laughs> she's dead and then i just like saw her standing across the room like there's no fucking way i wouldn't immediately go up to her right. uh, there's there's no way in the world yeah. but totally yeah. understandable but definitely the worst possible move yeah but it works out for him yeah, it does work out for him. Yeah, it was a moment that felt very human, and I, I did buy it. Yeah. You know, one thing that that struck me a few times in this book, and I don't think I'm necessarily criticizing the book. It's just something that that was occurring to me, is that you know, kind of the language here and the language that he uses elsewhere. He's like, "You're, you're, you know, Jane. You have you have a you have a piece of my wife in you, and you know, you're all I have left to remember her by." And, and it's like, dude, you have a son. <laughs> you just left, <laughs> and grandchildren. Yeah. Like, like what, what is like, that's way closer to being a piece of your wife because he actually remembers your wife. That was his mom. Like, I don't, it's not, it's not that I don't buy it. It's not that I think it's like bullshit. It's, it's that I'm just like, I did think it was kind of unrealistic. The idea that all of these people would just leave their children at the age of 75. Like they either, I was like, they must just mostly not have children. But he does have a child. He has a son. And, it, and the book does go out of its way to establish they don't have, like, the greatest relationship. Sure. But they're also not, like, alienated from each other. So mm -hmm. I just thought that was that, that was something that kind of tweaked at me a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Miss Evil Doom says, I and John completely forgot about his son. Because <laughs> there's no way – if you told me when I was 75 that I could go into space and I would probably never see my kids again, I would just – I'd probably just be like – no i mean i don't know maybe at 75 years old we'll feel differently about that right maybe. I, I, I i don't know um, that's not i mean just based on my having known old people <laughs> uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna just guess that 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 i won't feel differently but but you know what talk to me in 40 years i'm gonna i'm gonna call up my grandpa he's 85 and be like hey grandpa what if I could put you in the body of you at 20, but not just you at 20, like the best possible version of uh -huh. you at 20. And the only price is you never get to see me ever again. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Yeah. You ask him. You ask him. That's <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask him. I actually, like my dad's read this book. I kind of want to ask him. He's, I mean, he's got 10 years to go, I think, um, before 75. But I, I'm, I'm not saying nobody would take the deal, by the way. Like I'm, I can totally buy that there's a lot of, 75 year olds who would take the deal mm -hmm. I, I just I, I it it was something that I really kind of was like well I don't think I would take the deal so you would not take the deal okay okay good to know yeah. well we'll talk yeah. again in um 40 years yep all right all right all right so now we're moving on to John teaming up with the special forces team to go ask the Kansu about this weapon that they've given their enemies and then John gets to ask one final question and here it is you still have one more question, Jane said, and pointed me back in the direction of the ambassador, who stood, waiting for my last query. So I figured, what the hell? The Kansu can wipe out most of the races in this area of space, I said. Why don't you? Because we love you, the ambassador said. Excuse me, I said. Technically, this could have qualified as a fifth question, one the Kansu was not required to answer, but it did, anyway. We cherish all life that has the potential for unkat. That last part was pronounced like a fender scraping a brick wall, which is participation in the great cycle of rebirth, the ambassador said. We tend to you, to all you lesser races, consecrating your planet so that all who dwell there might may be reborn into the cycle. We sense our duty to participate in your growth. The Ray believe we provide them with the technology you question after because they offered up one of their planets to us. But that is not so. We saw the chance to move both of your races closer to perfection. And joyfully, we have done so. The ambassador opened its slashing arms, and we saw its secondary arms, hands open, almost imploring. The time in which your people will be worthy to join us will be that much closer now. Today, you are unclean and must be reviled even as you are loved, but content yourself in the knowledge that deliverance will one day be at hand. I myself go now to my death, unclean in that I have spoken to you in your tongue, but assured again a place in the cycle because I have moved your people towards their place in the great wheel. I despise you. And I love you, you who are my damnation and salvation both. Leave now, so that we may destroy this place and celebrate your progression. Go. I, I think the Kansu are pretty fun, actually. They are fun. This is, uh, this is fascinating. I, I, I like this a whole, whole bunch. And I wish it mattered. <laughs> like, so, 
this is this is the part Uh-oh. this is the part that to me seems so the most transparently set up for a larger story over the course of several novels to come, right? And that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wish Scalzi could have also kind of worked it into what he was saying in this book. And and I mean, yeah. maybe he is that like this is a place that views power and success only through violence. I, so, so so one possible thing that I was thinking about is like maybe this is basically what the CDF looks like in a thousand years. Sure. Where they they have not not just normalized their status their their really rather bizarre status quo, but decided that because we're doing it this way, that must mean that it is right, and then elevated that into a religion. And now they have this attitude of like, yeah, and we're going to nurture the other races that are surrounding us in space Mm -hmm. by being like the evil dark mirror of Star Trek, where like instead of the prime directive, it's like we're going to encourage all of the races to fight and kill each other um, in in some sort of like maybe Darwinian, but maybe just like like there is sort of a like the strongest shall survive vibe you get from the Kansu. Um, But uh, yeah, like I. It's not a clear line, but I can see a line between the CDF and the Kansu, actually. Yeah, I get that. Um, I don't know. I think my problem is, my my overall problem is, I still, even, we're, we're nearing the end of this conversation, and I'm still not entirely convinced I understand what this book is overall trying to say. What is what is the message this book wants me to walk away with? And And how does this scene tie into that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, yeah, well, once again, I don't know. And, and even the, the answers that I give where I say like, maybe it's supposed to be the future of the CDF. I'm like, I don't really think that's the case. It's just fun to kind of poke at the ideas sometimes. Um, sure. Well, let's move on. Cause we don't have any answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dot, dot, dot. Oh, well, uh, yeah. So next um, we have Jane revealing what it's like to be a baby. Jane stepped over and got right in my face. Do you want to know what it's like to meet the husband or the woman you used to be? To see recognition in his face and not to feel it yourself, no matter how much you want to? To know he so desperately wants to call you a name that isn't yours? To know that when he looks at you, he sees decades of life and that you know none of it? To know he's been with you, been inside of you, was there holding your hand when you died, telling you that he loved you? To know he can't make you real born, but he can give you con- continuation, a history, an idea of who you were, to help you understand who you are? Can you even imagine what it's like to want that for yourself, to keep it safe at any cost? Closer, lips almost touching mine, but no hint of a kiss in them. You lived with me 10 times longer than I've lived with me, Jane said. You are the keeper of me. You can't imagine what that's like for me because you're not one of us. She stepped back. I stared as she stepped back. You're not her, I said. You said it to me yourself. Oh, Christ, Jane snapped. I lied. I am her, and you know it. If she had lived, she'd have joined the CDF, and they would have used the same goddamn DNA to make her new body as they made me with. I've got souped-up alien shit in my genes, and you're not fully human anymore either, and she wouldn't be either. The human part of me is the same as what it would be in her. All I'm missing is the memory. All I'm missing is my entire other life. Jane came back to me again, cupped my face in her hand. I am Jane Sagan. I know that, she said. The last six years are mine, and they're real. This is my life. But I'm Catherine Perry, too. I want that life back. I don't, the only way I can have it is through you. You have to stay alive, John. Without you, I lose myself again. I reached up to her hand. Help me stay alive, I said. Tell me everything I need to know to do this mission well. Show me everything I need to help your platoon do its job. Help me to help you, Jane. You're right. I don't know what it's like to be you, to be one of you. But I do know... I don't want to be floating around in a damn shuttle while you're getting shot at. I need you to stay alive, too. Fair enough? Fair enough, she said. I took her hand and kissed it. So, I mean, I like this moment, and I like the ideas of Jane. Like, I I really like this, right? Like, the idea of, like, I am this person, but I am also this other person. I know I am. I can see it on your face, and I feel part of that inside me. I just feel like the book didn't dramatize this in any way outside of this single individual conversation like i just wonder what 
a version of the story from Jane's perspective would be. And I think I would like yeah. that version of the story better. Right. I mean, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that like I buy much like with a lot of this book, like I buy this as sort of a realistic and, and credible thought process for a character, but it doesn't feel dramatized to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partly just because we spend, as we said, like so much happens in the book. We spend so much time very tight in on John's point of view that the other characters don't quite feel real. Yeah. And I mean, I certainly never thought Jane was like actually his wife. And, and I don't think he does either. You know, like in, in, in any metaphysical sense. Sure. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that's fine because you're supposed to feel conflicted about it and confused about it because he does because it is a, a sort of it's one of those sort of weird edge cases where it's like well it it's it's a clone of her doesn't have her memories what does that mean exactly mm -hmm. it's understandable that he would feel connection to her but also she does she didn't share the life with him you know so it's just there's so much about the book it's almost like every idea in the book has been chosen to leave you with this feeling of lingering like uncertainty and and indecision about it at the end sure yeah no i think i think you're right um as as john is saying there's a lot of cool ideas crammed into this book but they don't lead to any one coherent thought or idea um and, yeah. and this is what i mean this third of the book almost feels completely separate from the first third and the second third yeah and it was my like least favorite part too it was mine too um, um yeah so. Speaking of which, let's move into Jane and John have made it down to the planet, which, by the way, I love this setup that, like, this is the most crazy, ridiculous idea ever. And you, the normal CDF soldier, could never survive this because we're the super CDF soldier. And then he, he does because he's John. Hey, I said softly and took her hand. You've been hit, Jane. You're okay now, but I need you to put in I need to put you in the stasis chamber until we can get you some help. You saved me once, remember? So we're even after this. Just hold on, okay? Jane gripped my hand weakly as if to get my attention. I saw her, she said, whispering. I saw Kathy. She spoke to me. What did she say? Jane's she said, Jane said, and then she drifted a little before before, fo before focusing on me again. She said I should go farming with you. What did you say to that? I asked. I said, okay, Jane said. Okay, I said. Okay, Jane said and slipped away again. Her brain pile feed showed erratic brain activity. I picked her up and gen as gently as possible placed her in the stasis chamber. I gave her a kiss and turned it on. The chamber sealed and hummed. Jane's neural and physiological indi indices slowed to a crawl. She was ready to roll. I looked down at the wheels to navigate them around the dead ray I'd stepped on a few minutes before and noticed the memory module poking out of the ray's abdomen pouch. The command setter rattled again with a hit. Against my better judgment, I reached down, grabbed the memory module, walked over to the access spindle, and slammed it in. The monitor came to life and showed a listing of files in Rere script. The, I opened a file and was treated to a schematic. I closed it and opened another file. More schematics. I went back to the original listing and looked at the graphic interface to see if there was a top-level category access. There was. I accessed it and had Asshole translate what I was seeing. What I was seeing was an owner's manual for the Kansu tracking system. Schematics, operating instructions, technical settings, troubleshooting procedures. It was all there. It was the next best thing to having the system itself. Uh-huh. I hope he quick saved after this. <laughs> well, he and gets then... he gets it home and, and turns it in. And I hope, I hope he went over it. Again. I hope there was one of those little upgrade units in the walls where you upgrade your gear. Because this is yeah. a video game, and then is the joke. Yeah, and then, uh, and then at the very end of the thing, he's now in charge of the Roughnecks, and we say, "Perry's Roughnecks." Perry's Roughnecks. Right. You maggots want to live forever. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's fine. I'm, I'm being, I'm being kind of shitty, actually. I, I, I don't think I even minded this much. I minded it this much at this moment because I think I had already, my mind had broken, and I was basically <laughs> already just consuming the story as a kind of wish fulfillment, like. Of course, of, of course, he was the one who found the SD card. Um, sure. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just, I mean, look, these are the type of things, like I, I've said this over and over again. These are the type of things that do not normally bother me. Right. This is just, this is, this is just 
like what happens in stories but it just okay. came it's just like this is the one that i think pushes the line as far as it can possibly go like he's in the middle of saving jane oh is that, is that the very thing that we're fighting this entire battle for just right right there and no one else would have found it but me well wow, look at that huh. Huh. look at that yeah yeah john you know, it is one... literally the same endpoint as starship troopers you're right the... he, he gets he is in charge of the company by the end yeah so the one thing that worked out for me that i liked the most i won't say the one thing it's not that i hated it the thing i liked the most was his wife's last words are like damn it where did i put that vanilla Mm -hmm. and right before jane gets blown up she says damn it where did i put that ammo clip Mm -hmm. or that magazine yeah and i was sure that she was going to be dead because the parallel was obvious right that it was a direct connection that he's going to lose his wife again and 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 uh, but then she doesn't die. But then she kind of does disappear, right? Yeah. She, she doesn't. She doesn't come back to him. Yeah, he never um, sees her again. Never sees her again. So, um, I, I like. I like that. I thought that that was that successfully impacted me emotionally. I, I mean, that's like that's the thing about this book. Like, I think we've been overall fairly negative on this book. I think it's a well written story. Like the individual prose. Like, I, I think there's a little problem with character voices, but. Other than that, like it's an engaging read. It's an like enjoyable book, and and there are some really clever things in it that I quite enjoy. But yeah, it's just it's at the end of the day, I just like rack my my brain against it. Just like okay, but what? Why? Like let's. I think this is a perfect way to get to. Let's look at the end, the last words of the story, and see if we can like use that to kind of coalesce everything together. All right, I'm sure we will. (laughs) Here we go. I haven't seen Jane again on Phoenix or elsewhere, but I've heard from her. Shortly after I was assigned to the Taos, Asshole informed me I had a message waiting from an anonymous sender. This was new. I had never received an anonymous message via BrainPal before. I opened it. I saw a picture of a field of grain, a farmhouse in the distance, and a sunrise. It could have been a sunset, but that's not the feeling that I got. It took me a second to realize the picture was supposed to be a postcard. Then I heard her voice, a voice that I knew all my life from two different women. You once asked me where special forces go when we retire, and I told you that I didn't know, she sent. But I do know. We have a place where we can go, if we like, and learn how to be human for the first time. When it's time, I think I'm going to go. I think I want you to join me. You don't have to come, but if you want to, you can. You're one of us, you know. I paused the message for a minute and started it up again when I was ready. Part of me was once someone you loved, she sent. I think that part of me wants to be loved by you again and wants me to love you as well. I can't be her. I can just be me. But I think you could love me if you wanted to. I want you to. Come to me when you can. I'll be here. That was it. I think back to the day I stood before my wife's grave for the final time and turned away from it without regret because I knew that she was not that I knew that what she was was not contained in that hole in the ground. I entered a new life and found her again in a woman who was entirely her own person. When this life is done, I'll turn away from it without regret as well, because I know she waits for me in another different life. I haven't seen her again, but I know I will soon, soon enough. Um, John Perry died on a shithole planet the next week. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would have accepted that ending, too. So, so I did have a thought, actually. Um, I thought that there were places here and there where I felt like we were making a kind of more or less obvious allegory between this and just the afterlife. Like, you know, what, you know, old old people literally just go, they just go away and you never see them again. You never hear from them again. And they're told that they're going to have eternal life and youth. But it turns out that it is they do get to have youth, but it's actually kind of screwed up. And then again, at the end of the story, it's sort of like the implication is like he's going to have another afterlife after this life. Mm -hmm. And if it's there, it's not it's not obvious. Like they talk about religion a lot. Like I was really sure of this reading toward the beginning of the story where they're talking about the Bible and they're talking about the meek inheriting the earth and all this stuff. I was like, okay, this is going to have a lot of heavy religious themes. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a lot of this uh, paralleling of what they're going through to the afterlife. I was sort of expecting there to be like 
heaven and hell imagery and demons and 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 redemption and and like all all these things that you associate with the afterlife and the immortal soul and it's like a like a tiny bit of that is in there yeah. but it really didn't persist in the story no um and i mean people in chat are talking about how a lot of this is supposed to be satire it's kind of making making satire of the um the the kind of military sci-fi genre obviously we talked about starship troopers um and that's true i don't know if it succeeds as a satire to me though um and i mean like i don't know people are saying like this is a great airplane read this is a great beach read but like it doesn't hold up to a two-hour book club which true not every book needs to be like dissected and analyzed in this kind of way right um but i mean i will say that some of this stuff occurred to me as i was reading so like I, I overall had fun with the, the story, but I, like it was just there were parts of it that I was just I, I was waiting. I was waiting for it to be a different book. And mm -hmm. it, it just I don't know. I, I think I'm fairly good at reading. And it just felt like that's what it was, the early book was setting up was a story that was going another another place. And yeah, I, I look, honestly, I kind of want to read the next books in the series. Like I enjoyed my time with it enough that I kind of want to see where this goes. But it just it was very it's very confusing to me. Here's here's the thing. Obviously, some books are more or less just a shallow beach read. But usually those books don't leave you with a continuing feeling like they're trying to be something more, mm. which is what this book did. Like it kept mm -hmm. it kept giving me it keeps giving you tidbits where you're like, mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. Where are we going with that? Oh, nowhere. Yeah. Once again. And that's what made me kind of go crazy. Cause like, yeah, like if, if it were just a beach read, I really don't think people would have recommended it. Like there's a lot of just kind of like pulp trash sci-fi out there that is literally just a beach read, mm -hmm. but no, y'all aren't going to suggest that for book club because you can't really talk about it beyond just like the bare basics of storytelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Again, like I, I feel like maybe we came off even more negatively than we really felt because I I liked it, I enjoyed it, I was just very frustrated by it, and um, and I don't think it made that strong of a footprint in my mind simply because I didn't know what I was supposed to be thinking and feeling about a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I, mean, I just feel like it's one of those books in which the only things to talk about with it are the things that I happen to not enjoy. So it's like. Yeah, <laughs> like the th the things that I enjoyed about the book. What can I say? Like, it was I liked the pacing. Um, the writing was the, the writing moved very quickly. I liked the 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 I liked a lot of the ideas. Um, I liked some of the the action scenes. I thought were well done. Um, I enjoyed the boot camp section a whole whole bunch. I thought that was really really great. And I think that as other people have said, that's the place where the satire really shows through. Is like you have a. a a, a boot camp instructor who like sits up as like, I know what you're thinking. I'm the, like the guy from all the movies, but I'm not, but also I am. <laughs> right. Yeah. I like that too. Yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, that's part of the first half of the book, which I think was, was mm -hmm. more fun for me at least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it I really think does. I messaged you several times throughout the book that was like, ah, this is when we move into the are we the baddies section. And you were like, I will reserve my comments till you finish <laughs> yeah. the story. And I was like, oh, does that mean he disagrees? Or I didn't know what to make of that. And it's that 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 never happens. Right. I mean, yeah, like you, you would say stuff and it would be very much in line with what I had thought, of, you know, while reading. And I was just like, OK, well, I don't want to. I don't want to dump on Scott at this point with <laughs> the degree to which I'm kind of annoyed by this book. Um, didn't, I didn't, I didn't hate it certainly, but like mm -hmm. the first thing we talked about when you finished it was basically just like, okay, what, what was, what is this exactly? What is this? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. What's this? Yeah. Um, I think, am I correct in saying this is Scalzi's first novel ever? I think uh, that's true. That's a good, good question. And, and if that's the case, like it, it, it feels it. Um, yeah. the, like the mistakes that I think are here, if, if we want to call them mistakes, I, I, I'm not comfortable declaring them that, but, um, if that is the case, like, it feels like the kind of things that, that people do in, in first novels that, you know, like the whole, the whole thing with the character voices sounding similar across characters, that just feels like a first novel thing, right? That's the type of thing that I, I think authors get better at over, over time. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I, I think you're right. It, and this is his debut novel. Yes, okay. it is. Yeah. Well, then, then for for a debut novel, pretty good. I, I I do wonder like the series continues on. I think it is going to be interesting to see how he kind of nails down these themes. Um, he like made a world that's fun to play in, and now 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 John, I want you to I want you to say something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He um um. It's funny. It was it was nominated for a Hugo. So interesting. Um, oh fuck! <laughs> he was thirty five when he wrote it. Matt, God damn it! What are we doing with our lives? It keeps happening. I know. It's okay. like it's never too late, Matt. And then we just we just skate on by that. It's never too late. Age. <laughs> it's, 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 it's never. It's, yeah, you're, you're right. It's never too. Yeah. Soon we'll be seventy five, and they'll put us in green bodies, and then we can start over. Yeah. What if like you get the green body and are like, fuck you, I'm writing a novel. They'd probably just kill you. They'd probably just kill you. Yeah. They, they didn't have to deal with any of those. That that, that happened off screen. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, John is John is saying that a lot of the ideas introduced here were really new at the time, which is I mean, it's good to point out this book came out sixteen years ago. Um, so maybe some of some of these ideas like the the multiverse and um the idea of transferring consciousness and, and stuff like that probably weren't quite as prevalent in pop culture as they are these days. Um, I'm Which trying to It's not think... to say this is the first book that did those things, obviously not, but yeah. Cause I was, I was reading a lot of sci-fi in that time period. Like I was in college and I was reading a lot of sci-fi short story anthologies I feel like sci-fi was pretty, pretty goddamn wacky back even back then. Like, I, I mean, sure, sure, there wasn't as much of it, and and this book does have a lot of different ideas in it, so I can give it some mm-hmm. credit there. But um, yeah, I don't have a good chronology of of sci-fi in my head. I mean, Blind Sight was written in two thousand six. Here we go. Here we go. Just one so, book club where we don't talk about Blind Sight. I mean, I mean, Blind Sight was written in 2006. This was written in 2006. So, so th- th- that's just a reference of like what was going on in sci-fi at the time. So. 2005. This was, so this was before Blind Sight. So that's true. Yeah. Blind Sight ripped off of John. Yeah, Blind Sight totally ripped this off. Yeah, you're right. There you go. <laughs> um, anything else? Anyone else want to talk about? We got people are talking about Jill Sargent Ruiz, who I agree was wonderful. I wish I had pulled a Rui slide I should have done that but yeah I mean they definitely like they just murdered his old man self right like Mm -hmm. and like oh he's brain dead and no he's not brain dead he's probably just an old man who's was a little slow on the uptake of realizing what was happening and then like didn't have time to react before they carted him off and murdered him right I mean they probably just had already given him like a fatal injection before they even did the thing I, I I mean it would be fun to reread this with the attitude that like John the character is just like an idiot just, <laughs> and and he's being manipulated by 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 everything that happens but um, cuz that wasn't my um initial um take No I mean I really like I really like the, the a couple ideas that we've come up with just to kind of circle back around that I really like I really like the idea that Leon was intentionally left for dead because he was too racist to join this army. And was like, this isn't going to work. Um, yeah. Maybe it's not even too racist. Cause I don't think they would actually have cared about that, but like just too, too ist to, to fit in with yeah. this army. Um, I, I love that idea. I love the idea that, that it is a very intentional that John like is thrust upward by the dumbest possible thing. Mm-hmm. And everything that happens after the initial, Oh man, I love that fucking commercial. Is just stupid uh-huh. intention, like it's just ridiculous intention. Yeah, I, I do love the reading that, like, the reason why he's the you know commander at the end is because of the jingle. Because <laughs> they wrote a stupid, stupid commercial jingle. Yep. Um, John John in the chat says that he hasn't read Blind Sight, and that is just a great opportunity for you to read my favorite novel, um, Blind Sight. Matt loves Blind Sight. If you you guys probably know Matt pretty well by now, or at least his his taste in literature, and it's the most Matt novel ever. Like when I read it, I was like, "This is this is Matt." It's like someone wrote a book for Matt. Here it I is. I mean, I mean, it, it's basically true that I that I'm I'm just like, well, I want to write a novel, but Blindside already exists, so what's the <laughs> point? 
course, that that kind of happens a lot on the book club where like we read something by Le Guin and I'm just like, oh, okay, well, yeah, I guess why bother? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's God, Ursula K. Le Guin is so good. I think yeah. she's. If if we had to ever like this is our forty fourth book club by the way by the way Jesus Christ forty number forty four folks, um, and if I ever was forced to like compile a list of my favorite authors that that I've, I've dealt with exclusively through book club because I had never read any Le Guin before we sat down to do this, um, I think she she'd be she'd be at the top of that list. Yeah, I, I think so. We Her did books... we. Stay with me. Yeah. We did, Michael. We've actually already done a whole episode on Blindsight. Yeah, it's one of the it's one of the many many book clubs we've done that everyone just has forgotten we even did because <laughs> it was so long ago. Yeah, so you can read it and then listen to that discussion. I did. I, I don't remember. Did I like that book, or was I just afraid? I think what happened was I put four stars on Goodreads, and you got mad at me. That's what I think happened. Yes. Well, I, I got mad at you. <laughs> no, you. Now, gave, you, you Here's yeah. what you did. You got fake mad at me to hide your <laughs> real actual anger. See, I don't I don't blame people for not loving it. I just it is my I I've said it's my favorite novel. Here, here's what I'll say. I I remember the conversation with you more than I remember the book and I I enjoyed mm-hmm. the hell out of the conversation with you. <laughs> it's a type of book that it's really fun listening to you talk about. And it's not not that I I didn't enjoy the book. It's just not it's just not my type of book. That's not a Scott book. That's a map book. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think that, you know, Peter Watts is like the novelist that Le Guin is. I just, I just think that Blindside is sort of perfect. He has a lot of really, really fun ideas. And, and yeah. unlike this book, he does super interesting things thematically with those ideas. Yeah. Every, it's one of those books where every, everything comes together, right? Like, yeah. like, even though you didn't love it, I think you can admit that like every, it's one of those books where like every facet of the story and character and setting and plot like like comes together in a way that's very satisfying. Yes. And this book is not. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You're not offending me. You're offending uh, Mr. Scalzi, who's in chat right now. So I'm sorry, Mr. Scalzi. Look, I did. I, I I enjoyed your book. It was fun. <laughs> I did too, and I can't wait to read the next one. Actually, I don't know if we'll be doing a book club on that. Probably not, but uh, I will read it. All right. Speaking sure. of next book club, next month. Boom. We're reading Foucault's Boom. Pendulum, which has been right. on uh, the vote for like four months now and just never quite got over the top. But it did this month. So have you read this book before, Matt? Have you read Umberto Eco's book? Is it Echo not, or Eco? I think it's Echo, but I don't actually know. Well, I, I, I can never remember what this book is about. Like, like, cause the, I don't know what Foucault's Pendulum means actually. Well, the uh, Washington Post book world says it's an intellectual adventure story as sensational, thrilling, and packed with arcana as Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Count of Monte Cristo. That, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> those are some good comparisons. Those, those are some good comparisons. All right. Well, I can't wait to do that. That'll be a great, uh, it'll be a great read, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we will be meeting to discuss Foucault's Pendulum on Friday, July 2nd at 9.30 p.m. right here <laughs> On YouTube, if you have any questions, comments uh, about that book or about any of our past books, including this one or Blindsight, you can always reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com, on Twitter at doofmedia, and of course, we need to add this, at our subreddit, which is r slash doofmedia, um, where you will find a post every month for a book club book that allows you guys to chat about it beforehand if you want to. Um, yeah, that's right. Before we go, Matt, one one question. Uh huh. If Blindsight is so good, why do they film Harry Potter but not Blindsight? I was trying to avoid yelling at people for saying that in the chat. So weird because um, they made eight Harry Potter movies and zero Blindsight movies. They've made zero Blindsight movies. It's true. Although somebody did write a spec script for it, which is on Twitter. So yeah, I remember when that happened. Who who wrote it? Was it someone? Who wrote it? It was someone it was that some, some guy. I don't know. No, it had to have been someone. So I don't had, know. It had to have been like an important. I feel like. You lost your mind about it. No, I, I just lost my mind because someone had written it, which doesn't actually mean anything. Okay. But it gives me hope that they can make a movie. But it's the kind of thing where I'm like, I don't really think there needs to be a movie. I mean, if there was, I guess that would be cool. Whatever. I don't know if it you could make a good movie out of that book. I don't know. It's so fucking weird. 
I guess you it could it would be really avant garde. I think is what it would have to be. Yeah, um, I I wouldn't want to be in charge of doing that because I feel like so much of what is special about it is the character's weird way of seeing things. Sure. Anyway, thanks for hanging out to talk about Blindsight with us, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you folks that tuned in live. Um, if you're listening to this after the fact, please consider coming and, and attending next month's or any of our future months. I think it's so much more fun when we have a bunch of people chatting and talking live. It's why we do these things live. It's it's part of it. So so please, please, please join us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you like what we do here at Doof Media and you want to see more of it, then head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. And consider donating to support our organization. At any available level, you'll get access to vote for the books we talk about each month, as well as a bunch of other cool exclusive features. So go check that out. That's right. And once again, if you have any questions or comments or just want to reach out to us, you can find us on Twitter at Doof Media. Email us at doofmedia at gmail.com or find our subreddit. That's r slash doofmedia. Make a post, say hello, chat us up. There we go. That's it. We're done. We'll see you all next month for Foucault's Pendulum by Umberto Iku. I like how the only word you pronounced right was Foucault. <laughs> I think I think I did we, that accidentally. Like I, I planned to pronounce it wrong and then it just it just happened. Yeah. Well I'm just gonna be sure to, to say Falcult the whole time. Falcult pendulum. Yep. <laughs> I'm gonna stop the recording, but chat is being really funny right now. How do I stop the recording? Stop. I think I think we should have a musical adaptation of Blindside because that would give you an excuse for like interludes into Siri Keaton's mind, which you wouldn't you wouldn't otherwise have that from sure. a normal movie. I mean, I'm of the opinion that um, that musicals would enhance any science fiction story. Yeah, I think I'm going to work on that. I'm going to work on a on an alternate script for a for a Broadway Blindside. Okay. Who sings the I Want song? Is it the vampire or is it the protagonist whose name I can't remember? Um, you need an I Want song to open your show, Matt. I think it has to be the vampire. Yeah. I think it has to be the vampire. Okay. I'll allow it. Okay. Who's is... like the, the who sings the antagonist song? It has to be the ship, right? It's got to be Rorschach. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like the and, the be prepared n number is this ship singing. This sort of writes itself. <laughs> I kind of actually want you to do this. <laughs> I know, like, you have so many things you have to do, but drop them all and figure this out. It's one of those things where if somehow the inspiration strikes me, maybe, but I don't think it will. It's a lot of work. A space a opera. I love that. Space yes. opera. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, okay, folks. It is late and I am tired because I don't sleep anymore. Um, so we're going to go. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thanks have, for hanging out. Have a good night. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Hope to see you next month. And uh, don't forget to, if you're going to purchase this book, we'll have a link for it uh, through our Amazon affiliate um, which will be out. I think I usually put those up the first of the month. So check back on Tuesday, June 1st to buy Foucault's Pendulum. That's it. Goodbye. Bye.